Hello, my name is Emmeline Heffernan. I'm a consultant paediatrician with an interest in endocrinology and I work at the Royal Belfast Hospital for Sick Children. Today I'm going to talk you through a few common endocrine emergencies, focusing on the emergency management, um, but also how the initial investigations allow us to reach a diagnosis. Then there'll be some take-home messages and further reading if you're interested. So the first case is a four-year-old boy who's had a generalised tonic-clonic seizure at home and he presents to the emergency department, he's post-ictal. His parents say he's been complaining of dizzy spells for the last few months. He's quite tired with headaches, abdominal pain and tingling and cramping of his hands and feet. He has a diagnosis of febrile convulsions, but importantly has not had a fever with this seizure. On initial assessment, he has an intermittent strider, respiratory rate isn't particularly high and his SATs are normal <clears throat> with no respiratory distress. His heart rate and blood pressure are fine, but there's cramping of his hands when his blood pressure is checked. His GCS is 14 and pupils are equal and reactive. His gas looks OK, but you notice that the ionised calcium is low at 0 0.8. So you suspect this child has had a hypocalcemic seizure or strider. What is your next step? A, admit him for uh, management of hypocalcemia and cardiac monitoring. B, give IV calcium gluconate as a bolus. C, check a PTH level, bone profile, magnesium and vitamin D while you insert a large bore cannula. D, start an IV infusion of calcium gluconate as per the BNFC. Or E, give a budesonide neb. So you might want to do several of these. Um, so just think what order you would prioritise these. So this is severe symptomatic hypocalcemia. This is the case if there are seizures, if there's tetany, arrhythmia or strider and the ionised calcium is below 0.9. So we follow the usual ABC management and treat any ongoing seizure as per the protocol. It's important to start a large bore cannula because of the risk of extravasation of calcium causing tissue damage. Ideally, take a PTH level before you start treatment. This is an EDTA sample, which must go to the lab within four hours, but doesn't need ice. Um, in our case, we already have a gas, um, so you would take bone profile and magnesium. Then you would give an IV loading dose of calcium gluconate 10%. The dose is 0.11 millimoles per kilo or 0.5 mils per kilo of solution. The maximum dose would be 4.5 millimoles or 20 mils. This should be given slow IV over 10 minutes. This is followed up by a calcium infusion between 0.5 to 1 millimoles of calcium per kilo per day. The maximum daily dose is 8.8 .8 millimoles and this is diluted as below um, and that the details of that are the BN, in the BNFC. If you can't dilute it to that you need central access. If the magnesium is low, particularly if it's below 0.5, then you should also give IV magnesium infusion. This is really important because if the magnesium is very low, it suppresses release of parathyroid hormone from the parathyroid glands. So um, the, the lab phone to let you know the corrected calcium is low, it's 1.6. The phosphate is high at 2.9, but the magnesium is okay. At this stage, your patient has completed the bolus of calcium gluconate and has started on the IV infusion. He's admitted to the ward with cardiac monitoring and also started on oral calcium supplements four times daily. He's stable overnight and by the next day, the corrected calcium has improved to 1.9. So he's able to stop the IV infusion, but continue on oral calcium and the dose of oral calcium can be increased. His parents say he's been having seizures from six months of age. They thought they were febrile convulsions, but actually hasn't had a fever with every seizure. He can usually has a brief myoclonic or generalised tonic-clonic seizure and is drowsy for one hour afterwards with strider. He's also a background of fatigue, dizzy spells, cramping and tingling of his hands and feet. And um, his mum is actually on calcium supplements too. He, on examination, he's pale and thin. He's got hypoplastic teeth. Trust X sign is negative. So this is when you tap on the facial nerve and you should get um, spasm of the muscles on that side of the face in hypocalcemia. Trousseau sign is when we inflate the blood pressure cuff and the ischemia causes carpopedal spasm like this. Um, so those signs are both negative now, but his calcium has improved. He has no features of rickets and there's no subcutaneous calcification. So the next day, his um, PTH level comes back. It's really low, below five, and that's at the time of hypocalcemia. Vitamin D was fine and there was no calcium in his urine. So what do you think could be the diagnosis here? 
Well, this slide just shows the homeostasis of calcium in the blood. Um, so 99% of the calcium in our body is actually in our bones. Only 1% circulates and half of that is ionized. So when you have an ionized calcium on a gas, you can assume that the corrected calcium in blood will be double that. So when the calcium level falls, this stimulates the um, parathyroid glands to release a parathyroid hormone as long as the magnesium level is over 0 0.5. This then, PTH then stimulates release of calcium from the bones. It increases calcium uptake in the kidneys, activates vitamin D and increases calcium uptake in the intestines as well, restoring a normal calcium level. So this flow chart is just a basic diagram to show you, you know, how you can figure out the cause of the hypocalcemia. So the PTH level might be back after a day, but in the meantime, you do have a phosphate level available to you. So if the phosphate is high, you expect that the PTH level will be low. As long as the magnesium is normal, then the diagnosis is going to be hypoparathyroidism. So that was the case with our patient. There's many causes of hypoparathyroidism, particularly common is 22Q deletion, but there are also genetic forms. And in our patient, it did turn out they had an autosomal dominant hypoparathyroidism caused by a mutation of the calcium sensing receptor. You can also get hypoparathyroidism post thyroid surgery or in autoimmune conditions. Um, on the other side of the diagram, if the PTH, um, the if the phosphate's low or normal, you expect the PTH will be high. So that could be vitamin D deficiency or resistance to vitamin D, liver failure, renal failure, or GI or renal losses. So just to summarize the key points in hypocalcemia, PTH at the time is the key to establishing the diagnosis. You should give emergency treatment if there's seizures, tetany, arrhythmia or strider with an ionized calcium below 0.9. Switch to oral calcium as soon as you can. And the phosphate at the time of hypocalcemia is a clue to the cause. So moving on to our second case, this is a nine day old boy, baby presenting with reduced feeds, vomiting and lethargy. He's a full term baby with born by normal vaginal delivery and he's lost 10% of his birth weight. On initial assessment, he's crying. His respiratory rate and SATs are okay, but he's tachycardic, hypotensive, and cap refill is very delayed at five seconds. His gas shows a metabolic acidosis, and it also has a low sodium and high potassium, but glucose is fine. So can you think of any differential diagnoses here? Could you think of two or three conditions that might cause this presentation? You suspect this child has a salt wasting adrenal insufficiency. So what would you like to do next? A, give IV hydrocortisone 25 milligrams. B, give a salbutamol neb. C, give IV calcium gluconate loading dose. D, start an insulin infusion and dextrose infusion. E, check cortisol 17 OHP and ACTH. F, give 20 mil per kilo saline bolus. Or G, give hypertonic saline 3% to correct a sodium to 135. So if you even think of the top three things you'd like to do and what order you'd like to do them in. So this uh, the emergency management then of adrenal crisis, obviously ABC approach, IV access, and really you should take blood for cortisol before you give treatment, as well as electrolytes, glucose, and ACTH. If this is the first presentation for this patient, ideally, if you can get an ACTH level as well, that's brilliant. That's another purple top, um, which goes on ice to the lab within 30 minutes. And in, in, a, in a younger child, you might take other blood such as 17 OHP um, and you can check a urine for urine steroid profile as well. You then want to give IV hydrocortisone two milligrams per kilogram, or as in this case, it could be four milligrams per kilogram because of shock. If there's no IV access, you can give IM hydrocortisone, 25 milligrams if they're under one year of age, 50 milligrams IM if they're between one and five, and 100 milligrams if they're over five years of age. If they're hypoglycemic, you'll give two mils per kilo of 10% dextrose, and if they're shocked, 20 mils per kilo of saline. It's important to see is the calcium above seven or are there ECG changes, because then you need to do emergency management of hyperkalemia. So you would give IV calcium gluconate 10%, similar to the treatment of hypocalcemia, slow IV over 10 minutes. Salbutamol nebs, usually three back to back, 
And if hyperkalemia is persistent, you would then give IV insulin and dextrose infusions. So we could give ActRapid or NovoRapid 0.1 unit per kilogram in 5 to 10 mils of 10% dextrose. If there is a significant metabolic acidosis, you could consider sodium bicarbonate as well. So ongoing management, these children often need ongoing IV hydrocortisone six hourly. The dose can be given um, as 12.5 to 25 milligrams per meter squared per dose, or an IV infusion of hydrocortisone can be used. It's very important if there has been severe hyponatremia, less than 120, particularly very low sodiums that we sometimes see, such as 105, that you try to avoid too rapid correction of the sodium because of the risk of osmotic demyelination. So ideally aim to increase the sodium by 0.5 millimoles per hour. But if there is abnormal neurology, you might can give 3% saline, one mil per kilo and repeat, and just give it in small increments and monitor the sodium. It's really important this is checked frequently. And you can also look at this urine sodium and adjust the sodium concentration in IV fluids so that you don't get too rapid an increase. Certainly by giving the sodium chloride bolus and IV hydrocortisone, you are going to cause a good rise in the initial sodium. If there is ongoing hyperkalemia in the child is at this stage in PICU, for example, they can be given calcium or a sodium polystyrene uh, sulfonate risonium orally or rectally. So going back to our nine day old boy, his airway and breathing were stable on reassessment. Um, his heart rate had improved and blood pressure had improved and cap refill has also improved. His gas uh, shows an improving metabolic acidosis. The sodium has come up to 124 and the potassium has fallen to 7.2. It's also covered in case of sepsis, covered with antibiotics and admitted to PICU. He's got normal male genitalia and there's no hyperpigmentation noted. An ultrasound is done. It does show his adrenal glands are bulky, which is a clue to the diagnosis. His renal tracts looked normal. Shortly after, the lab phones to say his cortisol level is only 18 nanomoles per liter. And the next day, his ACTH level comes back really high, and that confirms primary adrenal failure. A 17 OHP is also elevated, and that leads just to, to the diagnosis of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So this is a genetic condition um, caused by a deficiency of the 21 hydroxylase enzyme in the adrenal glands. So this causes prevention of um, production of aldosterone leading to salt wasting, lack of production of cortisol leading to shock. And then there, the pathway is shunted over to the right and this leads to an increase in androgen levels. So a baby with this condition, a baby girl will have virilized genitalia. Some babies also have hyperpigmentation and that is due to high ACTH levels which are driving the adrenal glands to try to produce more cortisol. So just to summarize a few terms that we would use um, in thinking of adrenal insufficiency. Adrenal insufficiency is any cause which um, of the adrenal glands being able to produce sufficient cortisol. So it could be congenital adrenal hyperplasia, genetic conditions or adrenal leukodystrophy. Usually there is insufficient mineralocorticoid production as well. So there will be salt craving, salt wasting. And if it's a primary adrenal problem, there will be hyperpigmentation and very high levels of ACTH. The ACTH level will be low or normal if this cause is coming from the hypothalamus or pituitary or if there's adrenal suppression. So adrenal suppression is the term if you've been on high dose um, exogenous steroids, the adrenal glands have basically gone to sleep and no longer making cortisol. In these children, there may be, um, they may be very Cushingoid and they have poor linear growth. An adrenal crisis is, is defined really by hypotension, hypoglycemia, seizure or coma. The triggers of an adrenal crisis could be just simply an intercurrent illness, if the child has had surgery or a general anesthetic, or if they've recently stopped high dose steroids, or occasionally if the child with an undiagnosed adrenal insufficiency has started thyroxine treatment, that can trigger an adrenal crisis as their metabolism is increased. So going back to our case, there was gradual improvement of sodium levels. He continued on IV hydrocortisone and then was converted to stress dose of hydrocortisone and then reduced to kind of normal three times daily dosing. The high IV doses of hydrocortisone have a good mineralocorticoid effect. So, but when he was on to oral stress dose hydrocortisone, he did start fluidrocortisone and sodium supplements. 
But despite medication, there were ongoing issues with severe hyperkalemia and requiring recurrent doses of IV calcium gluconate, salbutamol nebs, insulin and dextrose infusions. The sodium and fludrocortisone supplements continued to be increased and the potassium level settled. Um, the diagnosis was explained to parents with written information and peer support. So what do parents need to know in a child who's um, adrenal insufficiency? It's really important they know about the importance of stress dosing if the child is unwell. So if there's a fever over 38.5 degrees or repeated vomiting, the stress dose that we use would be 30 milligrams per meter squared per day, but given in four equal doses. Parents also need to know what to do in an emergency if the child has vomited their stress dose. In a baby, they could give rectal hydrocortisone and an older child, they're trained to give IM hydrocortisone. And in older children, there will be an ambulance alert and a school care plan done. We advise them to wear a medical alert bracelet and the parents should have a steroid card. And there's very good resources on the BSPD website about managing adrenal crisis and steroid cards, etc. So I just wanted to mention one other potential differential here, which is pseudohypoaldosteronism or PHA for short. This is a condition due to resistance, a resistance of al uh, to aldosterone, which causes low sodium, high potassium and a metabolic acidosis with dehydration and failure to thrive. So very similar to our case. The key, the key to this diagnosis is that renin and aldosterone levels are both very high, but the cortisol and 17 OHP will be normal. This condition is often the transient condition in infants up to around the age of three months. If they have a urinary tract infection or renal tract obstruction, it triggers this, but the pathogenesis isn't really known. There's also a rare genetic form. If there's consanguinity, you might suspect this type and it can affect just the kidneys or other organs in the body causing salt wasting and that's more difficult to manage. Um, interesting, there was a surveillance study in Ireland in 2019 and they found that the incidence of transient pseudohypoaldosteronism was similar to that of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So this is the kind of case we see every once in a while and it's just worth knowing about um, in case you come across it. So just to summarise the key points in adrenal salt wasting crises, symptoms can often be quite vague and non-specific, building up uh, before you get to the classical signs, for example, hyperpigmentation um, and then collapse. It's really important to check a blood for cortisol and ACTH levels before you give hydrocortisone. If there is severe hyponatremia, try to get gradual correction of the sodium 0.5 millimoles per hour. It's important to know the emergency treatment of hyperkalemia for the potassium is over seven or there's ECG changes. Always consider adrenal suppression in a patient who is on or has recently stopped high dose steroids, especially if they look Cushingoid. Commencement of thyroxine can occasionally precipitate an adrenal crisis. So if you're starting thyroxine, we would usually advise checking a morning cortisol level. So moving on to the last case, this is a nine month old girl who presents with an afebrile seizure. Her airway is patent, respiratory rate and SATs are okay, she's a little tachycardic, perfusion is good and she's unresponsive with a generalised tonic-clonic seizure in progress. Her blood sugar is low at 1.5 and capillary ketones are zero. Her gas looks okay and uh, sodium and potassium are fine. So this is severe hypoglycemia causing a seizure. We would do ABC and check a hypo pack with a blood gas, UNE, etc. Immediately you want to give two mils per kilo of 10% dextrose as an IV bolus. If you couldn't get IV access, you can give IM glucagon. The dose is 0.5 milligrams for a child under 25 kilos or one milligram if they're over 25. Then you'd follow up with IV fluids of 10% dextrose and normal saline at maintenance or fluid restrict if it's clinically indicated. Um, if there is ongoing hypoglycemia, glucagon IV infusion can be given if you suspect hyperinsulinism. And that can be started anywhere between one to 10 micrograms per kg per hour. The clues to hyperinsulinism would be like no ketones, like our case, or a high glucose infusion rate greater than eight milligrams per kilogram per minute, but often greater than 12 in hyperinsulinism. If you need to give a more concentrated dextrose infusion greater than 12.5%, that should be given centrally. And if you suspect adrenal insufficiency, you would give four milligrams per kilogram of hydrocortisone to a max of 100 milligrams. On the right there, you see the hypo pack with the gray top bottle, red top, acyl carnitines, and it's important to try to get the first urine passed uh, for organic acids. 
This slide is uh, from the peer guidelines, which are excellent guidelines in the management of hypoglycemia. So it just shows really the hypopac tests. So going back to our case, there was no acidosis and ketones were low. The hypopac subsequently came back with detectable insulin levels, leading to a diagnosis of hyperinsulinism. So just as a note really on the endocrine results of a hypopac and how to interpret them. So the glucose should be below 2.6 millimoles per litre for a true hypopac. At the time of hypoglycemia, cortisol should be greater than 450 nanomoles per litre. Check with your local lab what their assay cutoff would be. The exception to this can be neonates, where they may not always have as good a rise in cortisol. If it's below 450, you consider a synaxin test. If ketones are present at the time of hypoglycemia, that will exclude hyperinsulinism. The insulin level should be undetectable at the time of hypo. However, if somebody is given treatment before the hypopack was sent, there will be detectable insulin. However, if you've got ketones, you can ignore it. The level of insulin is not really related to the severity of hyperinsulinism. So any level of insulin is significant if there are no ketones. Um, the rise of growth hormone in relation to hypoglycemia can be delayed for 20 to 30 minutes. So um, you don't always get a very high peak. If the level is greater than 6.7 ngs per litre, that would exclude a growth hormone deficiency. Um, a recent hypopac audit that we carried out in Belfast showed the growth hormone results were really variable, ranging between 0.1 and to 95, with a median of 4.4. And we've never actually diagnosed growth hormone deficiency based on a hypopac. Um, but if the growth hormone level is low, certainly below 6.7, you should plot the child's height on the growth chart, compare it to their genetic target range based on their parents' heights. Or if you have a height velocity, look at that. And if they're growing poorly, just refer them to endocrine. So finally, just to summarize the take home messages for hypocalcemia, a PTH at the time of the low calcium is really the key to diagnosis. If there's seizures, strider, tetany or arrhythmia with an ionized calcium below 0.9, you will give emergency management with a loading dose, IV infusion and cardiac monitoring. In an adrenal crisis, you need to take a cortisol and ACTH if it's the first presentation. A 17 OHP is great if it's an infant. You give IM or IV hydrocortisone, IV fluid bolus and dextrose of hypoglycemia. You need to correct the sodium as gradually if there is severe hyponatremia and you should know the emergency treatment of hyperkalemia. In hypoglycemia, it's important to take a hypopack if the child is very sick, if it's an unusual presentation or recurrent hypoglycemia. The treatment of IV dextrose or IM glucagon followed up by IV fluids containing dextrose. So to summarise, these critical investigations sent at the time that you're dealing with the emergency are really essential to get the diagnosis and they guide the ongoing management. So if you're able to take them, that's fabulous. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so just some references and further reading. And thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take questions and discuss 